Welcome everybody to BLN Live. My name is Dior. I'll be your host today. We have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking with Tracy McWhorter. She's a public health nutritionist and she's going to be sharing her great program about 1 mil 10 million black women, black vegan women <laughs> that she's created. And we're going to talk about her efforts to kind of make that happen. And um, we're going to also discuss some of the things that people are most um they get the the most common misconceptions about going vegan so thank you tracy for joining me today i appreciate it thank you so much for having me it's great to be with you dior all right so um before we get started kind of tell us um what's the difference i know you said a public health i said a public health nutritionist kind of give us an mm -hmm. idea of the difference between that and the typical nutritionist people think about? Sure, sure. So a typical nutritionist or dietitian that people think about is somebody that their uh, doctor might send them to, right? Or at a hospital might send them to, to help them have a better diet, to give them a plan for eating better because they have experienced uh, a health issue. And a public health nutritionist, what I do is I am not someone who deals with uh, a clinical space. I actually help create programs and policy to help populations of people to change their behavior. And in this case, to eat healthier um, as, a, as a population group. So that would be the difference. However, my training actually did include um, you know, programs to work one on one, helping people change the way that they eat as well. So I got the best of both worlds. So you've been in this space for quite a while. You kind of accumulated all of that. <laughs> 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 so I know you, you know, author some books. So tell us about some of the books that you um, uh, wrote. Sure. So my first book uh, was By Any Greens Necessary, and I wrote that in 2010. And I just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of that in 2020. And that book was the first vegan diet book for Black women. So that was the first book that actually focused primarily, exclusively actually, on Black women. And um, it was a game changer when it came out because there were no other books out there that were like it, specifically talking about how and why Black women should go vegan and all about how to do it, the history behind why we should do it, how we've been leaders in this movement and veganism for generations. And so we can probably talk about that a little more as well. And then um, after that, I wrote uh, an African-American vegan starter guide in 2015 uh, in partnership with Farm Sanctuary. And that was the first African-American vegan starter guide, free African-American vegan starter guide that we know of. And that again was geared specifically towards black people um, because most free starter guides that you would find around at vegan festivals, at um, doctor's offices everywhere, were geared towards white folks. And so we needed something that was geared towards us. And it was a huge um, success. We've had nearly 500,000 free copies uh, ordered, printed, and downloaded, distri distributed all over the world. So uh, thirdly, um, I wrote Ageless Vegan, which, which was a cookbook and uh, how to go vegan guide again with my mother that was published by um, Hachette Publishers. And we wrote that in 2018. And that was, a, that was exciting um, because my mother went vegan with me when, I was, when she was in her 50s. So 35 years ago as well, coming up on 36 years. And so I wanted her perspective on it as well. So it was a mother daughter 50 and 80 at the time um, and a hundred of our favorite recipes. So those are the three, um, two books and one um, 40 plus page guide that I've written. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, 
you guys were <laughs> so ahead of the curve when it came to the vegan thing. Um, I bet you're probably overjoyed with the response uh, that is getting overall in our society today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I also want, just want to give uh, a shout out to um, one of my sisters in particular, um, Maria McCorder, who uh, we both co-founded the very first vegan website for black folks. So the first vegan website by and for black people on the internet period in 1997. So there were only five vegan websites on the internet in 1997 and ours was the first one by, of that five, ours was the first one by and for um, black vegans. So yes, I have actually been doing this work a very, very long time. Um, and that was also an influential website as well um, because it didn't exist before and we kind of made it a weekly uh, online magazine. So yeah, I've been doing this work a long time. So I have the benefit. I learned from folks who had been doing it even longer than me, which I can you know, talk about a little later in our conversation. Um, but just in terms of seeing how it's expanded online and in the culture as well has been, it's just been phenomenal and amazing to watch. And I'm happy to have been a part of helping that expansion to happen. Now, you mentioned that you kind of like been a pioneer as far as, you know, introducing veganism to the African American community. So what are some of the unique things that are in place, you know, being a black vegan versus any other kind of race? So there are a couple of couple of reasons why um, it's important to kind of talk about it in, in from a perspective from this perspective because number one um, veganism is old and um, it, this is not anything new so we have been doing this a very long time I mean you know obviously for folks who um, most black folks, who are on this side of the world were brought here um, through enslavement, the majority of us, right, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. And so our West, primarily West and Central African ancestors were plant-centered, plant-focused. Um, and that goes back to the earliest times, right? We were mainly eating fruits and vegetables and grains. Um, and so, we have that tradition that we carried with us, right? So the, the meat and the dairy that we may have eaten were not primary in the foods that we ate. So we carried that with us. And um, even here, you know, we, during enslavement, obviously we ate what we could eat, right? What was given to us and what we were able to catch to and grow ourselves. And then after enslavement, we still were primarily plant-centered because we couldn't afford to eat anything else in terms of dairy um, and meat. And so you had that going on as well. And we were able to make healthy, um, make our foods healthy, right? Based on the plant-based, the beans, the nuts, the grains, the fruits and vegetables that we grew, that we bought. And we carried that forth when we migrated into cities during the great migration. So actually, this is a tradition that is carried forward from um, Central and West Africa into the United States, into the Caribbean, into this, these parts of the world that have never left. It really wasn't until the 1960s that our diet changed to be primarily or more meat and dairy based. But in the earliest food surveys that were done in this country in the 1960s, African Americans were actually the demographic that was eating the most plant-based foods. We were meeting, we were the demographic that was most likely to be meeting the USDA's guidelines for consumption of fruits and vegetables and grains. Most people don't know that. Um, so this isn't anything new. This is something that we've carried forth, that we've carried forward. So it makes sense, you know, that as time evolves, as, as time has changed, we've continued that and it's grown exponentially. So um, most people may associate, you know, our food 
with heavier the you know with heavier soul food and that's occasion food that's something that we might eat during family reunions funerals weddings birthdays any kinds of occasion right any kind of occasion celebratory thing but it's not an everyday food and it traditionally has not been an everyday food for us we are primarily eating plant-based foods and then you have seventh day adventists who um in the early 1800s were uh, leaders in the vegetarian movement, and that included Black folks. And for example, Oakwood University in Alabama was started in the late 1890s and uh, as a Black Seventh-day Adventist university, and they were vegetarian. So as Black Seventh-day Adventists, we were pioneering different types of plant-based foods. So these plant-based burgers and plant-based um, you know, uh, breakfast uh, sausages and um, fish and things like that. We were pioneering those. Those There's nothing new there either. Plant-based cheeses, plant-based yogurts, plant-based milks, plant-based ice creams. These Seventh-day Adventists were pioneering that hundreds of years ago um, in, in, the, uh, in the 1800s and 1900s. So we already have been leaders and innovators in the vegan movement. This is nothing new. We're just carrying forth. We're running our part of the race in that in that tradition. Well, that's awesome. So I didn't realize there was such a long lineage with, you know, plant based foods. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people may think the same as well. Uh, We're going to talk, you know, actually a little bit more a little later on about your move to kind of bring us back to that. But, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of from this point, you know, as we kind of talk to people at this stage and in this time about veganism, what are some of the yeah. biggest misconceptions people have about becoming a vegan? Ah, so some of the biggest misconceptions are that the food is not going to taste good. Uh, the food is going to be uh, expensive and that um people might feel socially isolated if they go vegan and their family members, their social circles are not, right? So there's an issue of taste, there's an issue of affordability, and then there's a, the social aspect of it, right? There's the convenience of it. If you go out with your friends, you what are you gonna eat? If you're, you know, where are you going to eat? Is it gonna be inconvenient for you? Is it gonna be awkward for you? So these are the main three misconceptions or main three issues, challenges that people may face. And so what I tell folks is number one, you're already eating vegan food and it tastes delicious. You just may not be thinking of it that way. So if you eat fruit, if you eat vegetables, if you eat grains, if you eat beans, if you eat nuts, if you eat seasonings, herbs, if you eat spices, if you eat hot sauce, If you eat flour, if you eat oil, you know, if you season with these things, those are all vegan things. I always say that a dead bird doesn't taste good. You add seasoning, you add flour, you add oil, that is vegan. That's what makes it taste good, right, to you. So you're already eating vegan food. You're already more than halfway there. Um, No, I never. As far, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, were, no you you gonna, go were you going to say something? Okay. Well, well I never thought um, about those particular items as being vegans, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I didn't know I'm like a quarter of the way there already, right? Yeah, or more. Probably <laughs> more than 50%. You know, that's what, that's what is mostly what is on your plate, right? Or mostly what you are seasoning your food with. So you're already, you know, eating vegan food all the time, every meal, you just don't think about it that way. It's just a change of your mindset. And so you're already familiar with it. We just want you to recognize it and to um, to do more of it. In terms of, so that's the taste issue, right? Um, we've got that settled. Um, vegan food is actually, um, it's worldwide cuisine. Ethiopian, Thai, Indian, um, Mediterranean, all African. There's so many foods that are plant-based. They may not be primarily plants, um, but they are plant-centered, plant-focused. So it actually opens up your palate. And so that's the taste issue. I will say this, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. 
as far it's as the okay. taste, um, getting good vegan food doesn't seem to be as convenient or available as the traditional kind of foods that we have right now. I think that's part of maybe the difficulty. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to get a burger or pizza or um, a steak or a fish, you can get that almost anywhere at any time. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about, you know, a vegan options, um, those may be, you know, you may have less accessibility to those. So maybe that's part of the, you know, part of the misconceptions as well. Now, how do you address people say, well, it's hard for me to get vegan. And also the other mm -hmm. part to that, that it could be maybe expensive, you know, as a family, right. you know, it may be a little cheaper to get a pound of meat versus a pound of broccoli, you know, broccoli at two ninety nine a pound. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, um, and that's just a side, right? Unless you make it a, yeah. your entree. Right. So how do you right. tell so, people, how do you make the economics mm -hmm. works of being a vegan? So, it's actually not, it's not, it's not hard. Um, you just have to, you just have to rethink it. So um, your meals. So let's take that affordability issue because that was the second challenge, right? So um, if you are somebody who, let's think about what are your maybe top three meals you, you or, you know, your family, you might make during the week. It might be a stir fry. It might be a pasta dish. Um, and it might be a um, some kind of uh, burrito, some kind of wrap. It might be some kind of soup or, or uh, chili, anything like that. It might be something a little fancier. It might be a lasagna, right? Um, it might be a pot pie. All of those things can be made vegan and are already primarily vegetables. So let's take the stir fry because that's a really common dish that a lot of people make during the week. It's quick and easy, feeds a family. So you have uh, vegetables in it. You have all kinds of hopefully colorful vegetables in your stir fry already. So that might be onions and garlic and ginger and peppers and broccoli and string beans and mushrooms, cauliflower. Um, it might be kale, it might be um, uh, collards, it might be zucchini, it might be eggplant, like any kind of vegetables, right, that are your favorites. You might get frozen vegetables. They don't have to be fresh. And those frozen, you can get a frozen uh, Chinese style vegetable, uh, California style mixed vegetable and throw that in, saute it in water or oil, right? That's your vegetables. Now, most people might put in some uh, animal-based protein with that. And instead, you can use, you can put in cashews, you can put in Brazil nuts, you can put in almonds, you can put in chickpeas, you can put in black beans, you can put in red beans, you can put in tofu, you can put in tempeh, you can put in seitan. So there are lots of different ways that you can add the main sorts of protein to that stir fry. And you can have that over rice, you can have that over pasta, you can have that over quinoa. And in terms of rice, you can have it over black rice, brown rice, wild rice. You can have it over a whole grain pasta. Um, you can have it over whole grain penne. And that is a uh, very inexpensive, um, that's a very inexpensive stir fry dish that you have that is actually healthier because the main sources of protein, the beans or the nuts or the tofu tempeh or seitan, um, and seitan is just kind of a wheat gluten, um, made from wheat gluten and it kind of simulates um, like a pepper steak. Um, those have uh, no cholesterol and little to no saturated fat, right? And loads of protein and uh, other nutrients. So that's a very inexpensive dish. and that's a way that you can think about it so that you're, ma you're making a swap, right? And you'll find that if you use beans, if you use nuts, those are going to be, and you get them from the bulk bin, from your typical grocery store, those are gonna be less expensive, particularly if you use chickpeas or black beans, you can even use lentils, um, red beans. Those are gonna be more um, inexpensive than buying uh, ground beef. 
right? And so you have to think about whole foods, beans, all kinds of beans, all kinds of grains, all kinds of nuts as ingredients to make these dishes that you would normally make. So what would you say to the person that says, I like the idea of being more plant-based, but my lifestyle is too active. You know, I'm working out all the time. I got a job where mm -hmm. I do uh, a lot of walking and using a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I won't have the energy or the muscle proteins in order to, you know, live the way I want to live. Kind of, how do you address those people? Right. And so that is a myth as well. Um, and it's a great question. So um, one of the one of the best ways that um, I want folks to think about this question of muscles, maintaining an active lifestyle, maintaining your muscle, having energy is to think about nutrients as um, ingredients or, or um, components of food, right? So protein is a component of food. Protein is found in all plant-based foods. Some have more than others. So beans and nuts have the most protein. Tofu, tempeh have the most protein, but even an apple and avocado and veggies have protein, right? The benefit of getting your protein from plants is that you don't get the animal fat the saturated fat and the cholesterol, which is what clog your arteries and lead to chronic disease. That is what saturated fat, cholesterol, um, that is what you find in animal-based protein, right? So you don't, if you use plant-based proteins, you're getting the same energy, you're getting the same protein, you're getting the same uh, benefit to your health without the adverse effects. That's the difference. So. The meat industry has us couple protein and meat, right? But protein is a nutrient that is found in meat, but it comes, it's a package deal. It also comes with saturated fat and cholesterol. Protein is found in plants in abundance, and it does not have the side effects of saturated fat and cholesterol that can clog your artery. And when you get protein from plants, you're also getting essential fiber. Fiber is essential to keep our colons clean, to keep our bodies functionally, fun functioning properly, optimally. And that's what you want if you're active, if, if you're an athlete, right? You want your body to function properly. You want it to be optimal. You want to have peak performance. You don't want to be sluggish. You don't want to be, you don't want to have your bloodstream clogged with saturated fat and cholesterol. But that's what happens um, when you are getting your main sources of protein from animal protein. I always tell people you cannot you cannot out exercise an unhealthy diet. Healthy eating, healthy food is key. It's number one. They all work together, but the foundation is proper nutrition. So you mentioned kind of having a healthy diet. And, no, go ahead. I just wanted to also. Uh, recommend a documentary called Game Changers. Um, I'm on there. I'm actually a, an advisory board member only because the, the movie is excellent, but it's all about athletes who go vegan um, to improve their athletic performance. And we're talking about top athletes, right? We're talking about bodybuilders. We're talking about um, track stars, we're talking about, you know, all kinds of athletes. And so elite athletes. So I really wrestlers. So I really recommend that people watch the game changers because they do an excellent job of using science and evidence to break down this myth and to explain to you why eating plant based is healthier for athletes. Yeah, that's a very important myth to make people realize that you can eat healthy and cleaner yeah. and cleaner. Um, and it and still operate at top performance. Absolutely. The so, yeah, peak performance. At peak performance, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what are some of the things <clears throat> that people will notice once they start transitioning to a uh, vegan kind of diet or plant based diet, you know, to the general health and maybe even, you know, we're a beauty network, so maybe to their yeah. skin and some of the other functions of their body. Absolutely. 
it doesn't take long to start to notice changes, right? You know, you can notice changes right away, even within the first three to seven days, if you go 100% plant-based and whole food, right? Whole food is very important. Uh, it's a very important piece of this because you vegan food can be junky food. Potato chips and Oreo cookies and soda are vegan, right? So we were talking about whole health, healthy plant-based foods. And um, you can notice the results right away. So what, what we have found in our 21 day program is that women immediately have more energy. They can uh, lower their blood pressure. We found that women lose weight. The average weight loss is between nine, nine and 15 pounds in our 21 day program. Um, some women have been able to lower their blood pressure, lower their cholesterol, uh, and these are self-reported based on them getting their checkups done before the program starts and after. Um, some women have been able to reduce or get off of their diabetes medication. And these are results that we expect if women eat 100% uh, whole food plant-based with us for that 21-day period. And I do want to stress that in that 21 day vegan fresh start that this is the free online program we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. We're getting ready to go vegan the first seven days right mental prep and kitchen prep we actually don't even go vegan until the last 14 days so these results that i'm talking about women are actually getting those in 14 days of eating 100% whole food plant-based, whole food vegan, right? So lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, um, losing weight, having more energy, having more mental clarity, and uh, in some cases being able to reduce or get off of medication in that short window. Women have reported that their skin has cleared up. And I can attest to that personally, um, because when I went vegan 35 years ago, I was 20 years old in college, and um, I had acne and after, and I had gained 25 pounds my first year in college because I could eat whatever I wanted. So I naturally lost the weight and my skin naturally cleared up. And um, I say the glow is in the greens, the beauty comes from the outside, right? Um, it comes from the inside out, it comes from the inside. Your health is reflected from the inside, that's the glow. The glow is in the greens and the more dark leafy greens that you can eat during the day, the better because they're the healthiest foods on the planet. And that is what you will, that is the glow, the color in your skin, um, the, sh the sheen, and also um, just the general ease and mental clarity that you have um, that's also reflected in, in, your, in how you look. Wow, that's a, a lot of great benefits. And um, it's amazing that <laughs> it can be accomplished in such a short period of time. So absolutely, you know, let's say, you know, someone, you know, their interest is peaked, they're thinking about going vegan. So what has been, I guess, from your perspective, you know, the most difficult part of this journey for most people? What do they have the most problem with? I really think that the most difficult part is is um, not having community and feeling isolated. Honestly, I do because if you are doing this, if you know, if you live alone, whether you live alone or you have a house full of people, you know, family members, partners, um, children, parents, and you are the only one in your household who is deciding to make this change, and you are the one who is still cooking for everyone else, so you're still cooking meat and dairy can be very, very challenging because these are the foods that you ate just yesterday, right? That you are no longer trying to eat. Um, and it's difficult if no one in the family is doing it with you. And it's difficult if you are the only person in your household who's doing it and you don't have community. So it's really the support and the accountability that is so important. And that is what we stress in our pro program. It's community building. So you are not doing it alone. And I, the reason that I stress this is because, you know, everyone knows human beings are social animals, right? We thrive in social settings and social situations, interacting with other people. And especially when it comes to food, 
It's so important. Food is such an important part of our lives. So being able to cook for people, cook with people, celebrate with people, with food, go out to eat with people, um, all of that. People don't want to give that up and they don't want to feel uncomfortable. They don't want to feel awkward. They don't want to have to explain themselves. Um, they don't want to feel defensive. They don't want other people to, to uh, respond negatively or to feel defensive. They want to go out to eat and they want to know where to go to eat or how to ask for food if it's not a vegan restaurant all of that. So it's all about community and learning from other people how to do it, how they do it, and how to do it successfully. So community is so, so important. And it and it gives you accountability as well. So when you're thinking about going vegan, you, you know, you have a community and um, should your approach should be, you know, I'm a veganize the food I have been eating or should you mm -hmm. be you know, try to expand you know, the new types of foods that include more vegan choices. Um, instead of like, you know, for, for instance, you have a hamburger or you can have the, um, I can't believe it's a hamburger. Or I can't believe it's meat at um, Burger King. One of mm -hmm. those kind of burgers, you know, the, the vegan meat. So should you be trying to do that? If you, you know, like I said, veganize what you currently eat or just maybe look more towards expanding your your food options. I think it's I think you could it's and too. It's it's both. It's and both. So it's easiest to definitely um, try to veganize what you already eat. So I gave that stir fry example. I gave the pasta example, soup, a chili. So it's easier because most of the ingredients are already vegan. So it's the main source of protein that you're swapping in. You already cook that food all the time. And so it's just a swap, right? You already know how to season it. Um, and so it's just the swap, right, of, of beans and nuts or tofu or tempeh typically. Um, and you don't have to do tofu or tempeh. That's just, you know, a lot of people don't want to do soy for a variety of reasons. You don't have to. Um, but those are, those are things that you can do, beans, nuts, tofu or tempeh as swaps, right? And, you know, if you have a salad and you usually... Um, if you like big salads and you might put um, chicken or fish on your salad, then you can put beans or nuts, uh, tofu or tempeh on it, you know, instead um, in your stir fries and your tacos and your burritos, um, all of those things. Uh, for burgers, you can make your own burger out of black beans. They have um, burgers in the stores that, uh, that are made from things that you have already in your kitchen that are not foreign to you. So they, they already make them out of vegetables, beans, and grains. Those are the healthiest to eat, and you can buy them frozen in the frozen section of your store and still use your um, lettuce and your tomato. You can use you know vegan um, mayo. You can use uh, vegan sauces. Those are in the stores as well. You can um, put your mushrooms. I love onions and garlic, um, roasted red peppers and some sauteed uh, mushrooms on my burgers. So those easy swaps are a great way to start. And you can start looking at cookbooks. You can start looking at following your favorite vegan influencers online um, to get recipes. Recipes are everywhere. And you can go out to eat, right? That can be a good way to get started as well as you kind of dip your toe in the water and happycow.net. Happycow.net is the largest website in the world for vegan, vegetarian, and veg friendly restaurants, health food stores um, in the world. That's our, um, that's our go-to source for wherever you are in any corner of the world, they can tell you where to go, where to shop, what's available in your community. Um, so with our program that we'll get into a little later, we do everything for you. We have the meal plan for you. We have the recipes, we have the grocery shopping list. So we take care of all of that. We cook from scratch together live online. Um, and so you don't have to worry about trying to figure out what the vegan meals are you're going to eat during the program. We got that covered for you. Okay. Um, uh, you have a lot of great knowledge as far as 
the veganism, and you've been in the game so long. Kind of tell me what initially sparked this interest, because as you mentioned, when you got into this, you know, veganism was far cry from being like on the national spotlight. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of sparked it, and um, why you decided to, to stay with it so long? Well, I started it, um, I started going vegan when I was in college at Amherst College uh, in 1986. But I have to say that my mother planted the earliest seeds for me and my two sisters in that she was health conscious. So growing up, I was born in 1966. Um, I'll be 56 next month. And growing up in DC in the 60s and 70s and 80s, my mom was health conscious. So we, we were omnivores, meaning we, eat, we ate meat and dairy and plants, um, but uh, we didn't have junk food. We didn't have sweets. We didn't have a cookie jar. We didn't have sodas. We had whole grain cereal. We had skim milk. We had whole wheat bread because my mother you know, was really interested in reading up about health, raising healthy children. And so that's what she had for us. And I hated it <laughs> because I had cousins who had like the Apple Jacks and the Captain Crunch, Crunch Berries, and they had the Sunkiss and the grape juice and the Kool-Aid and they had the candy, the cookies, all of that. And so um, when I went over there, we have a huge family. So when I would go over to some of my cousins' houses, they had that. And I was like, wow, I love it. It was yummy. So um, I loved that, you know, so I loved the junk food and I loved, um, love, love, love meat and dairy. And um, we used to make uh, bake, bacon butter sandwiches. And I used to dip the bacon back into the grease can on the no, stove. I was going to ask you, right? what was the hardest food <laughs> to leave? What, what was the hardest food to let go? <sighs> The hardest meat, probably cheese was the hardest. Cheese took me the longest for sure. Um, cheese definitely, I mean, to this day, cheese still smells good to me. Like meat <laughs> doesn't, um, also because I know what it is, you know, and I know the, you know, it's a dead animal. I'm just, I mean, and the smell of it, it doesn't, uh, that left me a long time ago. Like that does not appeal to me at all. And I know the process of it, like the cruelty in, involved in factory farming. Um, there's cruelty involved in the production of cheese too, um, but it doesn't smell like burning flesh, right? <laughs> right. Um, so cheese still smells good to me. And it took me a very long time to let go of cheese. So for going from vegetarian to vegan took me uh, probably over a year. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I always say that, um, I am an unlikely vegan. I never thought that I would go vegan. I didn't like, um, vegetables when I was growing up, my mother had to force me to eat my vegetables on my plate. I was always the last one at the table. Um, so this is not something as a child growing up as a teenager, I ever thought that I would do. I had in junior high school, um, two teachers who were vegetarian and they made our class camping trip vegetarian. And I wrote a petition against it because I thought it was unfair. So I literally did not expect this to be my life, right? Um, but my sophomore year in Amher at Amherst College, our Black Student Union brought Dick Gregory to campus to talk about the state of Black America. And instead he talked about the plate of Black America and how unhealthfully most Black folks eat and why we should be vegetarian. And we didn't know that he had become a vegetarian 20 years earlier in 1965 because he extended the practice of nonviolence during the civil rights movement. He was a right-hand person to King. He extended nonviolence to uh, encompass animals. And so he stopped eating animals because of the cruelty involved in um, production of animals for um, factory farming, right? For meat and dairy. Um, but he still was a self-professed overeater, um, overdrinker. He weighed more than 300 pounds. He was doing it for animals, but not for health. And in 1967, um, a naturopathic physician named Dr. Alvinia Fulton, who opened the first health food establishment on the south side of Chicago, the first vegetarian cafe and health food store on the Chicago south side in 1958, came to him in 1967 and said, 
uh, I want to help you go vegan for health reasons. And so she introduced Dick Gregory to fasting and to healthy eating. And then together they wrote the classic book, Cooking with Mother Nature in 1974, I believe. Um, he started uh, basically a mini uh, vegan empire. And so um, he had the Bahamian diet drink. He lost uh, more than 200 pounds. So he was um, well known, was a multimillionaire just from that, not let alone, you know, his comedy career that he had in the 50s and, and 60s. Um, so by the so we didn't know this, right? We we knew him as a civil rights icon, a political leader, but we didn't know the vegetarian vegan part of his life. And he actually had been going around in the mid in late 1980s to college campuses around the country trying to encourage particularly black college students to go vegan. So at this lecture in my college uh, at Amherst, I, we were we were kind of shocked that he that, that he talked about that because that's not what he, we brought him there for. And I, he traced the path of a hamburger from a cow on a factory farm through the slaughterhouse process to a fast food restaurant, to a clogged artery, to a heart attack. And I ate hamburgers and cheeseburgers and hot dogs literally almost every day. Pizza, that's how I gained 25 pounds my first year uh, in college, like the year before, because I was eating whatever I wanted. It was a lot of meat and dairy. Um, and he also made the connections between why we eat what we eat, that it wasn't, you know, taste, it wasn't natural, it wasn't normal, it was actually by design, by the food industry to, um, in the in the USDA with um, subsidies to, you know, factory farms, to these um, unhealthy food industries, you know, to um, produce these foods, the McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, all of these places, all of this fast food to make it convenient, affordable, uh, cheap, really, and uh, easy to get. So, and they primarily, these fast food places primarily targeted black communities in cities after the assassination of King and after the rebellions. As I mentioned, our food, you know, the, the, the country's earliest food surveys in the 60s um, showed that black people were most likely to eat fruits and vegetables and grains and to meet the, the dietary recommendations by the federal government up to the 60s. But after they proliferated our communities with these fast food places after the rebellions, um, primarily for profit, but also as a way to employ young people, um, you had civil rights leaders who were welcoming these fast food places into black communities because it was a way for to employ young people, right? And so black entrepreneurism, entrepreneurialism, black capitalism became a way to quell um, unrest and rebellion, you know, after King's assassination. Um, and so within a 10 year period, we were the least likely to meet these recommendations for fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So this was by design, right? Mm -hmm. So Dick Gregory talked about all of these things that I had not known anything about, hadn't been told about. And I was a budding activist. I was questioning so many things that society was, was telling me um, I should do. I took the relaxer out of my hair. I was taking all of these classes on racism and sexism, uh, imperialism, homophobia, classism, colorism, like all of it, right? So it, I was ripe to hear that the way that society was telling me I should eat was problematic. And so that's why um, it resonated so strongly with me. And I immediately gave up hamburgers and hot dogs and meat after Dick Gregory's lecture. It lasted for about a week. Then I was like, cause I didn't know what to eat. And I was like, Dick Gregory's <laughs> crazy. But I couldn't get what he said out of my mind. So I did a bunch of research um, and we didn't have the internet then. This is 1986. So you had to go to the library and read what was available. So I did that. And um, my mother and one of my sisters uh, did the same thing. And um, you know, that following summer, he came in the spring of 86. I went home for the summer and did all of this research in DC. And by the end of the summer, we all decided to go vegetarian. And that's initially how it started for me. 
Um, I went to Kenya the next semester and then Howard University the semester after that. So my whole junior year was away from Amherst. I couldn't be vegan in Kenya um, because when I signed up for the program months before, I, I signed up as, you know, I was eating meat and dairy, so they weren't prepared. So I had to eat meat. But on safari, we went on safari for two weeks and um, there was a, um, at that time, they allowed you to to kill to eat to to uh, kill animals on safari and then have them served to you at a restaurant called the Carnivore, and so they served an animal that looked like a gazelle that somebody had killed and they brought it out. It had been roasted over a pit hole and they started carving it from head to hoof. And it was then that I said it was disgusting. I will never eat another piece of meat. That was 1986. The following semester, I went to Howard and when I was walking back and forth, I was walking past a black vegan community, literally in my backyard that I had known nothing about. And they owned, and there were 13 black vegan establishments, health food stores, cafes, bakeries that were the only 100% uh, vegan establishments in the city, in the nation's capital. They were all black owned and they were all in low income black communities. And so I immersed myself in this community and they taught me what, you know, expanded on what Dick Gregory had lectured about. And so that's how I became vegetarian first and then vegan from. And so I entered through blackness. No, I was just about to ask you about that. Had you, why not go vegan instead of veg, instead of veganism? I mean, I'm sorry, why, why not go vegetarian instead of going mm -hmm. full out vegan? So that was a process for you. And why did you decide to go past um, being a vegetarian to being a vegan? What was involved in your decision to do that? Because because of the dairy, I mean, it was difficult. I knew that I wanted to be vegan, like I wanted to be 100% uh, vegan, plant-based because it's the healthiest way to eat, right? But cheese, um, it was so hard for me to let go of cheese. and But I wanted to do it because cheese is so unhealthy. I mean, it, it's delicious, right? But, does it, but just because it's delicious doesn't mean it's healthy. Um, I mean, it's the biggest source of saturated fat in the American diet. Um, and it's uh, not to mention how cruelly it's produced, what has to happen to animals to produce milk, um, to cows. It's horrific. Um, thought, and it's very unhealthy. Yeah, I was thinking that um, dairy is highly inflammatory as well. Um, I, in your absolutely. joints. Absolutely. It's highly inflammatory. Yes. Organs. So it, it creates I, a lot I, of inflammation. Absolutely. Lots of inflammation, lots of mucus. It's one. It's you know, and most people of color are what's some people call it lac lactose intolerant, but it's actually lactase persistent. I mean, we normally and naturally stop being able to digest the the milk from our mothers, right? Um, because we're being weaned. We are then supposed to eat uh, plant based foods. We're then supposed to eat the beans and nuts, the greens, the whole grains, the fruits, the vegetables. Um, so we, we start to lose that enzyme that allows us to break down the milk sugar in our mother's milk, but we are supposed to be drinking our mother's milk, not the milk of cows, not the milk, uh, you know, that's, a, that's purely something that the, the dairy industry decided, um, to promote for us. Right. But milk is one of the dairy milk is one of the leading causes of asthma one of the leading causes of uh, among children. It's one of the leading causes of, um, you know, excess mucus, uh, inflammation, colic. Um, there's so many reasons for, uh, there's so many problems with milk, cow's milk for babies. I mean, cow's milk is meant to have a 600 pound calf um, grow into, you know, a thousand pound cow. Um, I may be getting that. I think it's 600 to, to a thousand, you know, that's the, that's, and they're only consuming their mother's milk, cow's milk. Right. So imagine all of that animal protein, the cholesterol, the saturated fat, it's normal for that animal, but we're not growing cows, right? We're growing infants, um, human infants, and they need their mother's milk up until they're weaned. And that's it. So when you are feeding them all of this other stuff that's coursing through their bodies, it's creating inflammation, 
can lead to asthma and so many other issues. And so, um, yeah, and, and, you know, we're consuming that as, as adults in cheese and dairy, um, drinking milk itself. Um, so it's, it's extremely unhealthy. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually criminal that the USDA still recommends, um, despite knowing that most people of color, um, you know, are lactase persistent, um, you know, so-called lactose intolerant, Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, um, primarily, but yet they still recommend that. And doctors um, get very little uh, nutrition education and uh, very, very little plant-based nutrition education. So they don't know. They're not uh, informed about how, how unhealthy milk is. And so pediatricians, unless you are getting somebody who, you know, is a vegan, vegan pediatrician and, or uh, who is vegan themselves or, you know, has taken the time to, to really get the latest information, not just what was taught, what's been taught in medical school for the last 50 plus years, the same old information, um, you're not going to get, you're not going to get, um, you know, unfortunately, the healthiest information for your child. So there's so many issues around that, about why we shouldn't be eating dairy, especially for black folks. Right. So that means they need to go get your books by, by, any, <laughs> by any greens necessary. And then your second book, what's the name of your second book again? Ageless Vegan. Ageless Vegan. And then they also mm -hmm. need to be involved in this awesome program that you created called 10 Million Black Women Vegan. So kind of tell us about you know, what inspired this um, creation of this program and kind of what is the mission and what you hope to accomplish with it? Absolutely. So 10 Million Black Vegan Women is a, a nonprofit organization and a public health intervention that I created uh, last year. And the goal is to help 1 million Black women go vegan every year for the next 10 years. So, uh -oh. so for the first anniversary of, um, the first 10 year anniversary of my book, um, uh, By Any Greens Necessary, the 10 year anniversary was in 2020. I, create, I helped 10,000 uh, Black women go vegan together. And this was during COVID. And so um, I wanted to kind of celebrate that 10 year anniversary in a big and bold way. And so I came up with this idea to help 10,000 uh, black women go vegan. And um, we actually had more than 12,000 women sign up a week before the program and ended up having 15,000 women go through the program. And because of the amazing health benefits, the success, the success of that, um, I really wanted to kind of expand that exponentially, right? And so I came up with this nonprofit, 10 Million Black Vegan Women. And our goal is really to change the health paradigm of Black women now and for generations to come. And uh, we have, we are fabulous you know, we look beautiful on the outside and um, we are actually the current face of veganism. So we're not only leaders in the vegan movement, but the majority of uh, vegans and vegetarians in the United States are black women. Um, and at 8% as compared to 3% of everyone else, but 90 plus percent of us are still eating an unhealthy meat and dairy based diet, the standard American diet. And so, um, we are, we are, and there are a variety of reasons for this, that we're doing this, um, but we have the power to make better choices now. And that's what our program is all about. So our next 21 day vegan fresh start, it's a free online program, helps black women go vegan together live online in community. And it starts September 18th. And that's the program um, that we would love for everyone to sign up for. And so you can find out more about it at 10 million black vegan women, uh, dot org or at 10 MBVW. Yeah, that is an awesome program. You know, you know, people normally, when they talk about beauty, they normally leave out the wellness and nutrition, and, and nutrition aspect of that. And so that's why we, you know, we're happy to, partner with you guys to make sure women take advantage of this program. And like you said, it's free. 
um, and it has all these cool benefits that you mentioned earlier that you would see immediately weight loss loss um, lower uh, cholesterol clearer skin so you know these are all things that kind of contribute to an overall beauty that you know we all to be our goal um, and, and I appreciate you for creating this but I also want you to talk about some of your um, advisory board you got some great people involved in this just kind of <laughs> talk briefly about that yeah absolutely thank you so we have um we have a, a you know board of directors we have awesome women on our board of directors and uh as you mentioned on our advisory council itself our advisory committee we have Bryant terry we have dr columbus baptiste we have Dietra dennis um we have uh susan vitka we have persia white um, we have Stacy Julian. So we have in um, we have women who women and men. We have um, Dr. Milton Mills. We have um, oh goodness, so I don't have the list in front of me, but um, so many um, oh gosh, so many good folks who have been uh, with us for a very long time in, in terms of supporting our work before ten thousand black vegan women in 2020, but just supporting me in general um, over all of these decades. And we are doing complimentary work. So these are folks who are vegan um, and or promote veganism and know how important it is and who are leaders themselves in their own organizations, their doctors, their other healthcare professionals, um, actors, celebrities, uh, philanthropists, uh, media experts. And so we have a range of folks. Um, and we also have people who have taken our program and, you know, are on the advisory council as well, because we always at every step of the way get feedback, input and insight and learn from the women that we are serving. So um, I want to get into the nitty gritty of this a little bit. So um, Give us an idea of what happens during this 21 day period. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're going to start off kind of like a little slower and get into it a few days after us. Exactly what happens and what kind of tools you, you have available to support the women as they um, participate in this program? Um, sure, sure. You can still hear me fine with this one. It fell. It kind of fell out of my ear, but I want to make sure we're still just positive. Still make sure you. we're still You're good. good. Yep. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I would love to dig into this a little bit more and tell you what we do. So if you go to um, 10 million black vegan women .org, you will see how to sign up. And it's a three week program, 21 days. So the first week is all about preparation, mental preparation and kitchen preparation, right? So we don't go vegan until the second week, but it is very important to have a foundation. And so part of that first week is you get a 56 page PDF, a guidebook that I created that talks all, that walks you through the entire program, what we're gonna be doing. It has the all important recipes that we're gonna be using, the uh, grocery shopping list that we're gonna be using um, it has a glossary of information, uh, the terms that we're going to be using that may not be familiar to you. It's going to have nutrition tips. Um, so there's so uh, kitchen tools There's so much great information. The PDF is kind of our guide for the three weeks. We have live zoom sessions where you get to talk to me, do Q and a, you get to come up on screen and meet each other, the other women who have signed up with you, the other black women in the program. We do breakout rooms so you can meet each other, encourage each other, see each other so that when you come into our online community platform, you have already met some of the sisters and you can start engaging with them right away. Our online program takes place on our own community platform and it's it's a hub, it's a, it's a family, it's the center of where our community lives. So we're not on Facebook, we're not on um, you know, YouTube, we're not on uh, Instagram, except through our social media handles. But the actual program takes place on our own online um, hub. And it is a fabulous community with pre-recorded videos, with live 
conversations, community chat, resources, um, more recipes. So it, it has everything so that we're active and engaged with each other during the entire 21 days. But that first week, um, you have to talk about your why. So you, you have to write, and, and I say have to because we really urge you to get clear about why you want to go vegan. Why are you doing this 21 day program? Is it because you have a, have a health condition? Is it because you want to lose weight? You wanna lower your blood pressure? You wanna lower your cholesterol? You've been diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes. You have had a heart attack. You have had um, a stroke. You have had some health issue that um, you think can be addressed and most chronic diseases can be addressed um, with uh, a healthier diet, right? And so what is the reason that you personally want to do this program, that you want to try vegan? Do you, are you already healthy and you want to maintain your weight? Are you an athlete and you want to have peak performance through a plant-based diet? So what is the reason for you? And that's so important because that's going to be your foundation during this challenge and during the outside society challenges, societal challenges that you may encounter trying to go vegan for 21 days, right? So um, we also get your uh, kitchen ready. So we talk about the kitchen tools that you'll use, the basic ingredients, the bulk ingredients. We go shopping. Um, and uh, we kind of get you grounded in that first week, right? Get you ready. The second week we go vegan together. So you are going to be cooking along with us, with lot, with our chefs, our guest uh, chefs. We have live cooking classes. We have pre-recorded cooking classes. We have Zoom sessions and we are going to be eating together. Most importantly, you're going to be uploading your food photos and talking about how it was for you to make the recipes, to go grocery shopping, to eat the food, and to encourage other women who are doing it with you, see how they're doing and interact with them. Um, and we also start our free fitness classes. So we have a fitness component with Coach Stacy J, um, and we are doing fitness classes as well. And those fitness classes are pre-recorded and live. So we get you live and pre-recorded so that you can always access the information. And then we do that again in the third week. And then we have a, a celebration Zoom call at the end. And if you pass, uh, pass the, you participate um, at least 75% of the program, you get a personalized certificate of completion after our celebration call with our celebrity guest. So um, there's, a, there's a whole lot that happens in our program and we are basically holding your hand to get you to take this step. And even if, you have, if you're already vegan, this is a great way for you to get new recipes. This is a great way to have a refresher for you. And it's also a great way for you to get your family and friends to go vegan for 21 days if they have not been able to hear it from you. Sometimes you can't hear it from the people who are closest to you, right? Or you need some quote unquote experts in their minds other than you um, to kind of guide them. And so it's for everybody, wherever you are. If you're pre-vegan, if you're a curious vegan, if you're an experienced vegan, we have tailored this for everybody. Um, and so um, we have daily activities, daily um, announcements, um, again, we, we interview live experts all throughout the program. So there's so much, there's so much that happens. Um, it's very organized. We have a calendar for you. We tell you what to expect, what's coming up. You can RSV, RSVP to events that you want to attend, or you can watch the replays. So we now have our, something for everybody. Uh, do the, do the ladies have an opportunity to, um, I guess, ask questions, get some feedback from the experts as well? Absolutely. All of our, we have um, live events in our online community. Um, and so all of those include Q&A, our Zoom sessions, our regular Zoom calls. Um, we have those during the week as well. Those include Q&A. And um, we have our community chat. So we have our team in the background that is always uh, there to answer questions that that folks have, um, but yes, absolutely with our experts, they all include Q&A. 
Okay. So I guess you no, know, we've kind of got all the information now. The last thing is, you know, is there anything we need and how do you get started? Okay. Kind of just go over that as far as, you know, I know you said it's free, but tell us exactly if we want to participate, what we need to do. If you want to participate, and I hope you do, I hope that um, Beauty Lifestyle Network shows up and shows out in our program. It starts September 18th. Go to 10millionblackveganwomen.org. Or you can go to at 10 mbvw that you see there on the screen and you can link directly there from our bio and just sign up and we will help you take it from there. Once you sign up, you'll get a welcome email and we'll take you all through how to get ready for the program. You don't have to wait until September 18th to sign up. You can sign up today and join our community. We have active uh, interviews and activities to do leading up to the program. So you're engaged um, for this next month as well. And we really, really want you to sign up, not just by yourself, but encourage your, your friends, your family, your sister, your aunts, your mom, your grandma, your children, your cousins, your social group, your church, go vegan together. It is so, you go so much farther with your community. So not only the community that you're gonna meet online, but your own community that you have now, do it together. Do it together as the Beauty Lifestyle Network. You will have so much fun checking in with each other, giving each other accountability, encouragement, support. Um, and it's and you'll just have a lot of fun if you do it with each other as well. Well, there you have it. You have all the reasons to get involved, health, community, and um, you know, just upgrade your beauty and your inner peace and your inner health in a very positive, fun way. Uh, introduce some, some great new foods or maybe uh, twist on the old foods. So this should be a lot of fun. Uh, I did have another quick question. Now, I know it says uh, 10 million black women, black vegan women. Is this open to guys as well? Well, it's, an, it's a free online program. So, you know, it, that's the internet, right? It, the, but, um, the program is geared to black women. And so um, that's who the program is for. And that's who our target audience is. Um, and, you know, we have had, um, we have had uh, lots of folks um, tell us that they signed up, that they joined the black women in their lives um, for support and also because they wanted to do it themselves. So, um, this is a, you know, it's for black women. It's led by black women. And if you want to be a part of it and support the black women in your lives, that would be awesome. It, and it, you know, it would really, um, it might be wonderful, uh, if you are partnered with a black woman or related to a black woman and, uh, you know, it will, it will not only benefit you, but it will really help them as well um, to, to stick with it. So if you're a black woman and you have a significant other, no, they can't possibly, maybe they don't participate fully, but they can take advantage that you're in it and they can kind of go along with you on the side, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, it's, and it would be, and it might be, yeah. And it might, I mean, they can, they can fully do it. It's a free online program, as I said. Um, and it might, and if you think it would really encourage the women in your life to do it and to stick with it because they may be um, cooking or grocery shopping uh, for you with you, uh, why not do it with them, right? It benefits you and it benefits them as well. All right. Well, thank you, Tracy. We appreciate it. Uh, for all of those who are interested, make sure you check out uh, Tracy's information at 10millionblackveganwomen.com, black right? Dot org, 10 million dot org, black vegan women dot org. Yeah, I know it's a mouthful, um, but we we uh, purposely titled it that so that people know exactly what our goal is. 10 million black vegan women. So it's 10 million black vegan women dot org. That's where you go to sign up. And um, I really, really hope to see you all there. It will be, I think you'll love it. And it's just a great way to to get your feet wet into veganism, or again, to, to refresh your veganism if you're already there. All right. Well, um, 
as Tracy mentioned, make sure you check out the website. You can also find a different information about it on beautylifestylenetwork.com. We have a page talking all about it. it has Tracy and has a beautiful video and um, has a link to where you can sign up as well. So make sure you check out beautylifestylenetwork.com. We've today been talking with Tracy McWhorter. Um, she has this wonderful organization called 10 Million Vegan, Black Vegan Women. And um, it's been a pleasure, Tracy. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. For me, purchasing beauty products was not that great of an experience. I can remember when I was looking for makeup for my skin and I had been using an organic makeup that I was getting from a very expensive grocery store. <laughs> I didn't feel comfortable like I had an opportunity to ask any questions about the product. And when I finally did get to a consultant and ask them, what's in this lipstick, what's in this, they really didn't know. So when it came to my hair, that was even harder. I would go into the beauty supply, and as you know, it's just aisles and aisles and aisles of product. But what I didn't know, what was right for my natural hair. And again, I was faced with the same dilemma. Who can I ask? Nobody really knew anything about these products. They were just selling them. It wasn't a great experience, not being able to get the right amount of information from the people who I was buying the products from. So that's one of the things that I love about the Beauty Lifestyle Network is that it's a community of information as well as a bunch of great products that have been proven to really, really give you the look that you're looking for when it comes to your hair, skin, and body.